Um, <laughs> thanks so much for coming. I'm Kathleen Johnson. I'm a professor in the Earth System Science Department. I'm also an enrolled uh, member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians in Michigan, where I grew up. I have been a professor here since 2007 um, and have done a lot of work with some of the people who are, you'll be hearing from today. And um, as some of you know, I'm also the, I have a few different hats I'm wearing here today. I am, first of all, the co-chair with Professor Franklin Dollar of the Native American Faculty and a Native American and Indigenous Faculty and Staff Association, which is one of the diversity affinity groups that um, exists on this campus. And I'm also the PI and director of a new program called the UCI Climate Justice Initiative, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And we are training several um, PhD student fellows as well as post baccalaureate fellows who are studying climate change from different disciplines. Um, but with a STEM heavy focus. And we're taking these students and we're giving them a year long training program where they learn how to do community engaged research in a way that's ethical and non-extractive. <clears throat> and they work, um, they learn about environmental justice and receive cross-disciplinary training. And they also are working on research projects that they are going through a process of co-designing with four community partners. Um, one of whom is Sacred Places Institute, who you'll hear from um, the director today. And so that's partly just to provide a little background for this event. And so the, we wanted to bring in, um, as a climate justice initiative, we wanted to bring in folks from the local community to speak to our student fellows in the program. We also have, I'm very, also very excited that we have um, several students who are part of the American Indian Student Association here today. And everyone else, welcome. So um, we're really very honored to be hosting this important event, which is being co-sponsored co by these different organizations that I just mentioned. Um, I also forgot to mention the Research Just Justice Shop, um, which the co-founder and co-director, Connie uh, McGuire, is there. And she's working very closely with our Climate Justice Initiative on running the workshops and training programs and working with our community partners. Um, okay, so we've invited an esteemed group of panelists today um, from the Hashiman and Tongva communities and are very much looking forward to hearing from them and for an engaging, informative, and uplifting event. Um, but before we begin, I wanted to address another important aspect of this event. As many of you know, we are here on the unceded and, uh, and shared ancestral territory of the Ahashman and Tongva peoples. Uh, what you may not know is that within these communities, there are multiple tribal nations, each with their own constitutions, election procedures, and tribal governments. Um, sometimes these governments have territorial and membership disputes. Um, and as academics who are not indigenous to this place, it's not appropriate for us to make judgments on these issues. And we understand that people here in a gathering such as this one uh, may share a range of perspectives, um, opinions, and emotions that can arise. So we encourage open and constructive dialogue. We must stress the importance, though, of maintaining a respectful and civil um, environment throughout this event. So this is crucial. Sorry, I had to write. There's a lot up. I had to write it up. There's a, this is crucial for the safety and comfort of all participants, as it ensures that everyone feels safe and able to express their thoughts and ideas without fear of harassment and discrimination personal attacks. To that end, we kindly request that attendees adhere to the following ground rules. Um, respect and civility, first and foremost. So please treat all participants with, re with respect, regardless of their background, beliefs, or viewpoints. Active listening, we encourage active listening and open-mindedness, considering other people's perspectives. Inclusivity, um, this event is a platform for diverse voices, and we would like to make an effort to include and respect all voices, regardless of their origin or experience. Um, we would ask that there are no disruptions. So please refrain from any disruptive behavior or actions that may disrupt the flow of the event. And of course, as with anything on this campus, um, any, any um, discrimination, harassment, or any form of hate speech would not be tolerated. Um, we take these very seriously, and we want to make it clear that there will be consequences for those who who do not abide by them. While we hope for a peaceful and productive event, 
in the case of any violations, plans are in place to address the situation. And our goal, of course, is to ensure, not to be a downer, our goal, of course, is to ensure that this event is a safe, inclusive, and productive space for all participants. So we're confident this is possible and we appreciate your cooperation and thanks for understanding and commit your commitment to the success of this event. Um, now, <laughs> onto the good parts. Without further ado, um, I would first like to introduce um, Angela Mooney DRC, who is somebody that I've known for a very long time. We first met through the American Indian Summer Institute in Earth System Science that I directed for several years here in collaboration with, um, with the La Jolla Band of Los Enya Indians. Um, one of our alumni, I can't not say it, one of our alumni is here as a student at UCI, Chelsea. Um, and, and Angela would come to this program every year and share her expertise around environmental justice issues um, that we're facing indigenous communities in Southern California every year. And since then we've done several events and she'll share a little bit, I think more about the history of this particular event. Um, so I'll just go ahead and read her bio. Angela was born in her ancestral homelands, whose traditional territories include the area now known as Orange County and raised in the ancestral homelands of the Osage, Ka, and Wichita peoples. She's been working with Native nations, indigenous peoples, grassroots and nonprofit organizations, artists, educators, and institutions on environmental and cultural justice issues for over 20 years. She's the executive director and founder of Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples, an indigenous-led grassroots environmental justice organization dedicated to building the capacity of Native nations and indigenous peoples to protect sacred lands, waters, and cultures. She co-founded the United Coalition to Protect Panha. I always forget how to say that. Did I say that correctly? Pan, Pane, right. an alliance of Ahashaman people dedicated to the protection of the sacred site Pane and served on the board of the um, La Aguilar Adobe Museum and Ahashaman Cultural Center for nearly a decade. She received her BA from Brown University and her JD with a concentration in critical race studies and a focus on federal Indian law from University of California, Los Angeles School of Law. She currently lives and works in unceded Tongva homelands now known as Los Angeles, California. So we're gonna go ahead and have you um, kick off with your perspective. I know you just got out of traffic, so. <laughs> Oh. Can you guys hear me better now? Oh, for the Zoom. Okay, I was like, got it. I understand. Thank you. Um, so apologies for, for being late. I blame colonization. <laughs> Seriously, man, talk about the Hoshman folks. Like, we don't have it easy here on the coast. The millions and millions of cars. I left my house at like 345. <laughs> And I live in Venice, so on the, you know, very close to the coast part. Um, anyway, thank you all for being here. It's always um, makes my heart happy to see folks show up for things like this, especially since it gets dark at like two in the afternoon now. <laughs> um, and thank you, Kathleen and everyone else uh, who has helped make this possible. Um, yeah, Kathleen and I have known each other for quite some time. Um, I also was an adjunct here for many years. Uh, thank goodness, I think the whole reason for that was so that I could meet this young woman over here, Gabrielle Lassos, <laughs> who was in uh, my Native history class during the pandemic. And as soon as I found out she was Tongva, I was like messaging her, come work for SPI. <laughs> um, but but uh, what I learned in the many years uh, as an adjunct professor here is how woefully inadequate this educational institution is when it comes to acknowledging or informing you all as, as students, staff, faculty, um, and administrators about whose actual ancestral lands they're on. I'll never forget the first time I taught a native history class here, I had about you know 60 students and it was the first day of class. And I said, okay, um, can anyone tell me whose ancestral homelands we're on? Raise your hands if you know. I heard Cherokee, Chumash, Lakota, <laughs> not one person in the room knew whose lands we were on. And this was an upper level class. This wasn't like an intro to native studies class. So um, that uh, I, I've written about that moment before because it was such a surreal moment of being hyper visible at the front of this class and yet simultaneously being completely invisible and erased. 
And that really is, in my opinion, the experience of us as coastal indigenous folks in Southern California, especially. Um, you know, one example of that is the show, which I love and I'm so grateful to see native folks and native issues highlighted in reservation dogs, but the map they show on there um, totally erases the Tonga people whose ancestral lands that um, a good portion of, of the show of the last season takes place on. Um, and so that's the kind of erasure that those of us here are facing. And I don't have the answer as to why, but I think one piece of it is that it is a beautiful homeland that we have. And it becomes a lot more challenging to live here freely if people are engaged in thinking about what it actually means that they're occupying someone else's homeland. And so it's in this kind of context that Kathleen and I started to talk and think about ways that we could do some small part to change that narrative and that story here at UCI. And so we work with others in our Hashimim and Tonga communities to create this series. And Seth Davis, who's no longer at um, the law school here, but he was, he's a native law professor who's now at Berkeley. Um, but he worked with us to create this series, Cultivating Consciousness on a Hashimim and Tonga Homelands. Um, and it was really important, you know, we I think we collaborated at one point with some of the land use planning faculty and schools because as folks are learning how to plan in these lands, to me, it's like a most basic thing that you need to understand one, on whose lands are you planning? And two, that those folks are still here and alive today. But unfortunately, that's not what often happens. So that's how Kathleen and I started this. And I'm really glad, um, you know, the pandemic was hard. And so it kind of went away for a while, but I'm really grateful to see it starting again now and for my fellow panelists here um, and for all of you for, for coming. And so I think that's all I have to say at this moment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. All right, so yeah, just we're gonna have um, one additional talk from one of our speakers before we bring all of them up for and introduce everyone for the panel discussion. Um, so now I would like to introduce um, Teresa Stewart Ambo. Teresa Ambo Tongva is an assistant professor in the Department of Education Studies at UC San Diego. Her research has focuses on the role of higher education in native nation building by examining the historical and contemporary community university relationships between public universities and native nations in California. So very topical. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna hand this up to you and I will pull up your presentation okay. back here. Thank you. Um, hi everybody, it's really great to be here. And um, we were messaging so I would say thank you, Kathleen, for the invitation to come present again. And thank you, Angela, for recommending me um, and to my panelists. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to share space with you um, in this capacity because I, Tina and I share space in a weaving group um, every month. And so it's nice to, uh, for different parts of our lives to intertwine in these sorts of ways. Um, uh, as Kathleen says, I'm Teresa you could just call me Teresa. Um, and I work at UC San Diego. A few years ago, uh, when I was pursuing my doctorate, I was really curious around, you know, what is the relationship of UCLA um, with my, my um, which is located on my ancestral homelands with my tribal community, um, which is very diverse and there's multiple bands um, and the relationships and politics are very complex. Um, and so about, well, I guess, what is it? I don't even know the math. 2017, I started going around talking to tribal representatives, um, predatory leaders, elders, culture bearers. I talked to university representatives to get an understanding of what these relationships look like. Um, and that kind of grew into this work that I do now. Um, and I always think like my, my research is so ridiculous. It's so stupid. People already know this sort of stuff. But then I see institutions, like Angela said, where, where it, that are filled with people that are incredibly ignorant and I see leadership at universities continuously make mistakes when trying to engage Native people. Um, community, Native nations, Indigenous people, you know, uh, like uh, broadly speaking. And it's not anyone's fault. I think when you know better, you do better. Um, but I also think that there's a lot to learn. Um, and so I have done a lot of work over the last few years to try to understand what does this look like in California? What does this look like across the country? What does this look like in other places in the world? Um, and I'm starting to see different patterns. And so I wanted to share a little bit about that work 
um, before the panel and not take up too much time um, from our other wonderful speakers. Why do we talk about this? Um, and so I think this quote from Janice Gould, who's Kankal Maidu, Maidu, is really critical in thinking about um, our, relation, our university's relationship to indigenous lands. Um, and the quote is, and I modified it a little bit because um, it's an older quote from 1992, but it's, it is obvious that there is not a university in this country that is not built on native land. We should reflect on this over and over and understand this fact as one fundamental point about the, universe, about the relation, relationship of Indians to academia. And so this kind of always situates my work and my thinking. And I think that, you know, several years ago, there wasn't this consciousness or awareness or receptiveness to understanding um, native people as like continuously inhabiting their ancestral homelands. I also wanted to share a little bit about the context of California. And this is very, my spouse said, get rid of this slide because there's too many words on it. <laughs> um, but you know, as an ed scholar, like I'm always interested and in, because I look at history a little bit, I'm always interested in the intersection of like federal policy, state policy, and then specifically like how did these universities emerge? And so you kind of see like this cascade of events that are like nested within each other around colonization on the West Coast and on the East Coast. And I always think it's interesting how people don't realize that West Coast uh, contact and colonialism essentially preceded that on the East Coast. Um, colleges and universities are a, a, a huge system in the US. They started in the 1600s um, and they financially benefited from funds to civilize, um, quote unquote, civilize indigenous youth. Um, so Harvard, Dartmouth, um, many of these institutions have a legacy um, that's connected to uh, uh, efforts to assimilate indigenous people, uh, especially or in particular native youth. Um, and then we see like the introduction of the mission system, um, enforced religious conversion and that as a form of education, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, in California in particular, the Rancho period or Mexican governance um, and then how you see a series of these events in the mid 1800s um, around like the seizure of land, um, genocide in the state, the gold rush, the signing of the treaty, um, act for the protection, the government, act for the government and protection of Indians, uh, treaty making period, all these efforts to remove indigenous people from their lands. Um, you know, nevertheless, we are still here. Um, it was a incredibly um, poor attempt. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I think about, or in the, in the work that I do in particular, I try to think about or ask like, well, what, what is happening at these institutions right now and how they relate to, how, do, how are institutions um, working with indigenous people? And so the few um, ways that I have found in institutional leaders working with indigenous people are these different ways. A lot of times institutions are exploiting indigenous people for their labor, for their knowledge. Um, they have very limited knowledge about indigenous people. Um, there's no official relationship, no government to government relationship, no institutional relationship. It's a person within an institution working with a community partner, um, but there's no effort in that's, that sense. Um, relationships are very reactive. You know, there's a crisis, there was an issue on campus, they're not proactive. Um, they delegate the responsibility to indigenous faculty or indigenous units. And there's really, um, one thing I found is there's a desire to improve, but there's a lack of motivation or effort. Um, in talking to representatives, native and non-native on institutional campuses, um, these are some quotes from native people. Um, they shared, uh, well, uh, the first quote is from uh, a leadership, a leader in the UC system that says, I'm not aware of tribes in the immediate area. He's now a chancellor at one of our universities. Um, another uh, person shared with me um, in this conversation around what is the current nature of the relationship between your university and the local community? Um, uh, another person said, as the executive uh, vice chancellor or the number two in charge, for the most part, the university doesn't really have any relation, any kind of hardwired relationships, with any tribal communities. <clears throat> another participant said, our university only has relationships with Native nations or Native people, tribes, uh, unless they're mandated to. Um, and then this last quote here really talks about how people are only interested in working with Native people now that they have uh, economic resources to do so. And so I see a lot of head nods. We know that this is happening, um, but like uh, we're trying to generate a sort of language around like how do we talk about these sort of relationships and how are we pushing institutions to think organizationally about how to foster relationships in respectful ways. 
Um, this is how I, I reviewed about tw 200 articles and have a literature review coming out that starts to characterize these relationships so that you in the university, indigenous people outside of the university, whatever your placement is and how you're trying to engage native people, you can start to have language that communicates, well, we wanna foster a political relationship with native communities. Uh, we wanna have a curricular relationship with communities. So I found these one, two, three, six different types of relationships across literature from all across the US. I have about 200 other articles to go through. But these are primarily the ways that universities, individuals, departments, programs, institutions are working with Native nations. Um, primarily, the main type of relationship is the research relationship, um, right? That's the way, especially research institutions, we relate to Native people by conducting research with them. Um, primarily uh, occurs as being on them. Um, the other way that institutions work with Native communities is through a political legislative sort of relationship. They're only, only, they only do it because they're required to. Um, and right now in California, we see this primarily through repatriation policies. Um, but there's other policies, um, not necessarily in the literature, more around consultation policies um, that, that are requiring institutions to work with Native communities. Um, and so there's other ways, external relationships, this more formal sort of connection with um, Native nations is coming in the form of memorandums of understanding or agreement. Um, and we often see the emergence of tribal liaisons or tribal advisors in our institution. We have curricular relationships, socio-cultural relationships, and economic relationships. Um, and so these are the spread of relationships that we're seeing. Um, and so this contribution really is trying to, like, like I said, start to generate a language around the type of relationships that exist between institutions. And this could be applied to other fields, but I'm focused on education institutions. And then um, I, uh, I, do, I do my best to try to create a taxonomy, if you will, or some guiding principles or some guiding points around how do you respectfully engage indigenous people, Native nations, Native organizations. Um, I try my best to draw on literature and scholarship that exists in American Indian studies um, that really leans into all of these R's. Um, we see it used quite frequently in different um, fields, um, especially indigenous studies, um, but really encouraging institutions to form respectful relationships that are rooted in responsibility. Um, that relationships are reciprocal, but they're not really focused too much on mutuality. Like you, like you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, but it's more like we have a debt, we have a responsibility, we need to be accountable to you morally and ethically. Um, that the relationships are relevant to Native people. Um, a lot of times the resources that foster relationships are from individual faculty or programs, institutions, uh, their highest priority is demonstrated in their budget um, from year to year. And so a lot of times relationship building, liaisoning with tribes, um, it is unresourced and it actually comes at an expense to the community. I mean, so these are some guiding principles that I have developed um, um, that are helpful in kind of thinking about our panel conversation that we have here. And so I wanted to offer this um, as a starting conversation point um, for us. And I will share for those students that are in the um, in the room and those that are part of the climate justice <laughs> initiative. Um, I have uh, various resources, um, some that I cited here, and I'll we'll share the slides with you all so that you have the resources so you could do the look at the literature on it. And that's it. Thank you so much, Teresa. So um, now I would like to invite our four esteemed panelists to join us at the front here. And I will um, introduce the two that you have not yet met. <laughs> um, so first of all, um, on the far right, we have Sierra Velardes. Um, Sierra Morningstar Velardes is a member of the Wanenio Band of Mission Indians, the Hashima Nation. She's been a cultural practitioner for her tribe for over 15 years, and her passion is educating the different communities that cover Southern California on the Hashman, on Hashman people that inhabit this area. And then next to her is Tina Calderon. Uh, Tina is of Gabrielino, Tongva, Chumash, Mexican, and Yoimi descent. She's a wife, mother, 
grandmother, sister, niece, and auntie to many. After retiring from a career as operations manager in the manufacturing industry, Tina began, home began homeschooling her grandson and devoting time to her culture and language. Tina is currently on the Tongva Language Committee, and she is a student learning uh -oh, <laughs> the Smuic, Smuic dialect dialogue of Chumash. Tina is also a singer who enjoys creative writing and composing poems and songs. She's a culture bearer for her family, as well as a traditional dancer and storyteller who strongly believes in honoring her ancestors by sharing their history and educating others about their tribal relevance. Um, we're very happy that all of you were able to join us today. Um, and I've got a series of questions prepared. And just ahead of time, let me say that you don't feel don't feel the need that, that you have to respond each of you to every one of them if you don't feel like you have anything to add or you'd rather pass that's totally fine but the first question i did want to ask for everybody here um and some of it you've already shared a little but i think you all have more to say so um could you each please start out by sharing a little bit more about your background your current work and the ways in which you stay connected to the native community Hi there. Um, I'm greatly honored to be here. I'm thankful that Angela gave me this opportunity to come and speak to you guys. Um, once again, my name is Sierra. I am part of the Hoshman community. Um, I am the granddaughter of the late Chief David B. Ballardis. He passed in 2014. And within that time, I grew up into this community, this culture. And I watched my own elders fight for federal recognition, and now I'm just kind of blossoming into my own um, pathway, following their footsteps. So, in the last, you know, decade that or 15 plus years, really, I was on the board for Blossom Guevara Foundation, where we have a museum that shows cases um, past, present, and our future with um, this area, and then. On that, I'm currently working with Crystal Cove to enhance their curriculum on different um, native plants and animals and trying to really get us back into um, just showcasing yeah. what people that are really here. But thank you. Hello, relatives. Um, yeah, so I'm a culture bearer, and what that means is I spend a lot of time speaking to people, to schools, uh, students from the little ones all the way through college, and even organizations um, to educate people about um, <clears throat> our traditions, our ways, our culture, and most especially that I stand with a lot of pride um, with the teachings of our ancestors, because they left us so much, you know, um, reciprocity, we talk about it, but it's not just the word, it's a way of life. And it means that you don't take anything without asking permission. You don't take anything without giving a gift first. You never take too much and you never waste anything. And so when you live your life that way, you become better stewards. And so I have a deep passion for our lands and our waters. I'm of the belief that when the peoples were being colonized, so were our lands and our waters. And that the people cannot heal until the waters and the lands heal. So that's where I spend a lot of my time. I wear a lot of hats and I do work for Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples as the Director of Ocean Protectors Program, as well as the IYEJ, uh, the Environmental Indigenous Youth. And I always get that all backwards, but <laughs> I basically work with Homeboy Art Academy <clears throat> to try to, um, to just empower them, you know, and teach them about their culture as well, because we're all Indigenous to somewhere. But I also spend a lot of time around the MPAs, the Marine Protected Areas, and um, the health of our MoMA, our ocean, because the, the waters that are supposed to be the fresh waters flowing freely, they're not, they're dammed up, they're controlled, they're concreted, and a lot of toxins get into that water system and flesh out into the ocean. So it's all about educating people and um, getting people to take the responsibility as the new stewards of the land to stand up with us because all of us are doing a lot of work. Everyone in our community is doing a lot of work, but we're very few. And so we really need the help of all of you all. Um, so um, the other thing that I'm here to represent is the Hachiman Tungva Land Conservancy. 
which I serve as the treasurer of. I think that's it. Hi again. Um, <laughs> as you already heard, I'm the executive director and founder of Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples. Um, so our mission is to build the capacity of Native nations and Indigenous peoples to protect sacred lands, waters, and cultures. Um, and when I founded the organization 11 years ago now, I'd been dreaming of it for about a decade before that. Um, really owe a lot of gratitude to Sierra. I didn't grow up in my homeland. I grew up as far away as you can get from Momot, uh, the ocean in the middle of Kansas. Um, <clears throat> and when I graduated from college, I knew I wanted to return home. And so I had um, Sierra's grandfather's phone number and I called up the tribal office and as Indians are wont to do, he said, okay, come live with us, even though <laughs> it was him and his wife and his son and wife and their two daughters. <laughs> they found room, right? Um, and I say that, you know, as a joke, but it's uh, it's really telling, you know, that is indigenous culture and um, for better or worse, right? For better and that we have traditionally been and continue today to be familial, but that kind of ethic also was a very different ethic than the settler colonial extractive ethic that showed up here. Uh, and you see that in, in the way that the conflict emerged and continues to emerge today. Um, but I founded Sacred Places Institute because I saw that even though as indigenous peoples, our traditional pre-settler colonial epistemologies were very much rooted in thinking of the future, thinking seven generations from now, the nature of the settler colonial beast is that it required us to be <clears throat> a lot more reactive when you know there were uh, threats to our sacred sites or cultural sites, that's when our communities were mobilizing to take action. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I wanted us to be, um, to re-embrace those traditional ways of thinking strategically and not in response or reacting to a settler colonial system, but being more originary and embracing our, our traditional ways. So that's why I formed Sacred Places Institute. And it's been quite a journey. I'm so grateful now to have Tina and Gabriella and other folks on our team. Um, it was a lonely road 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you know, land acknowledgements weren't a thing. 10 years ago, no one was even considering us as still existing today. And, you know, that's the other part of why I formed Sacred Places Institute is because I wanted to have a collective space where other folks didn't have to be in it alone the way I had, you know. Um, and so that's what we do. You know, we do legislative work, policy work, media advocacy, work with youth. Um, the sky's the limit because the need is vast and um, we have to be creative and nimble and use multiple strategies to, to protect these sacred lands, waters, and cultures. Me again. <clears throat> Hi, everybody, it's me again. Um, I don't know what, I, I, I think everybody in our community is so brilliant and so wonderful. Um, and in our, our neighboring communities are, um, and, and everybody has a particular role and my, calling, if you will, has been to be a researcher. Um, I didn't think that I would go into academia. It was never a plan. I was a student in ASA at my at UCLA when I was an undergraduate, and I was too concerned with planning the powwow and <laughs> getting the youth conference done and running, ironically, the retention project that I got kicked out of school. Um, and then I got back in and I graduated and I thought, I never want any Native students to feel this way. So I worked in student affairs. But then I was supervised by very incompetent people. So I thought, I'm going to get a master's. And then the master's led me to get a PhD. And now I'm here. Um, and I didn't plan to do this, but I fell in love with research um, because I think, uh, for many reasons, um, but I think re we are inherently researchers. And research touch touches like even today in this modern world, every part of our lives, there was so much research put into that laptop or to the sticker on your laptop, right? Um, and so that I feel like is my superpower and my calling is to be a researcher. And so I write about land acknowledgements. I write about 
historical relationships with universities and native nations. Um, do like a lot of like interdisciplinary deep historical work. And then I do what I shared with you all. Um, I look at contemporary partnerships and try to um, develop language around how to build relationships with communities and sometimes intervene on them at my own university. Um, and so um, when I'm not doing that, uh, I'm sleeping a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love to nap. Um, no, but when when I'm not doing that in my community, um, I feel like I've also been called to weave. Um, and so over the last few years, I or you know, like what it's been like less sixteen months or so. Um, I'm uh, participating in a weaving group, um, Noahemi Poku, which uh, means weaving as one. Although I've heard there's other um, interpretations of that, uh, Gabrielle is also part of it, and so I share space with these two um, people here. Um, so and that's also something that I do in my community that brings me a lot of joy, um, and a lot of peace, and a lot of a sense of belonging, um, and community, and um, connection to my ancestors, um, and an opportunity to express myself as I guess as an artist. Um, so. I stay connected to my community. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna combine some of the questions here because we're definitely not gonna get through all of these. So the next thing I want to ask you all okay. is whether you can share some information about traditional customs or practices that are important to your tribe or your community. And going along with that, how have changes in Orange County and Southern California, a place with very rapid development and vast disparities, um, how has that affected traditional practices? Practices. <laughs> I mean, I can start because I think my answer will be shorter. Um, for me, it means I don't engage in traditional cultural practices outside of like, you know, when I can come down and, and work with Sierra or her dad, which is maybe once a year. Um, but the reality is I wasn't raised here. And because I didn't have, um, I wasn't blessed the way that, you know, Sierra was to be raised with people who still knew and understood their culture. And as Tina indicated, there are just a handful of people in our communities who are doing this work now. Um, and the other piece of that was, you know, that I felt, as Teresa mentioned, you know, we all have our calling. And since I was a very little kid, <laughs> I've been told that I have a, a big mouth and a lot to say. <laughs> Everybody who knows me is laughing really hard. <laughs> Nobody's denying it. Um, but <clears throat> in all seriousness, it was through bearing witness to the desecration of development in our homelands. Um, and because I was living, you know, with the person who at the time was the chief and chair of our nation, I was able to bear witness to some of this desecration firsthand. And at the time, I naively thought... Um, well, I'll just become a lawyer and then I'll fix the problem. And then I pretty quickly realized in law school that the kind of change that I wanted to see wasn't going to happen through the settler colonial courts. It was, I'm going to you know, have to take on community organizing. Um, but I will say that, you know, there's a direct, one of the reasons that so much of the work <clears throat> we focus on in Sacred Places Institute is about land rematriation is because, um, you know, something I thought about a lot during the pandemic a question we asked ourselves a lot is what does it mean to be in, from a native nation with no land base whose homelands are one of the epicenters of a global pandemic during a stay at home order, right? It meant effectively that aside from individual tribal citizens who had land or who were able to, you know, hold title to property, we had no place on which to engage in traditional cultural practices, because there isn't a separation from the land and the people, right? And so um, for me, the land rematriation work, I guess, is my, it's not a direct cultural practice, but it's everything in terms of what I can contribute to our communities being able to have a resurgence of those practices and a place for the people that are still engaged in that, like these folks around me, to do that kind of work. I think um, for myself, I'm um, a ceremonial person. And so practicing your culture is every minute of the day. From the minute you wake up, you give gratitude. And um, I have like a little water ceremony that I do from the minute I wake up. 
<laughs> um, but it's, it goes deeper than that because yeah, there's um, our weaving, there's our language, which ties us to place. Um, there is songs that I create and poems that I create sometimes in my native languages. So all of that is cultural, but I just believe it just, it goes deeper than that. You know, it, it's your every single day practices, it's your mindset and it's being respectful to everybody. It's being inclusive to everybody because that's what our communities have always taught us. There's a place for everybody. Everybody has their own skill. Everybody is valued. Everybody contributes. And there, you know, it's it's a lot of work to live in community, but we did it and we do it. And it's a little bit harder because now we're spaced out. We're not as connected. And so that's kind of one of the blessings of COVID is that we've learned to connect online. We can do Zoom. We can connect or, you know, from people with people from a great distance away. And so even though it's not the same as having a fire and being in person with people, we can still connect with one another and we can still encourage those traditional values and the traditional ways. And even some of the crafts can be done over that way. And so now that we're back to interacting again, it's really beautiful um, that I am blessed to have two very close communities that we can gather and we can go uh, sit around the fire. We can sing, we can tell stories, we can encourage each other. We make regalia and jewelry and just talk and just encourage each other. Um, so that to me is what community is. And that's um, part, of, part of our practices. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> um, part of that question that kind of to me, what ha what development it's done and it's affected our customs. But, um, you know, I, me growing up with my grandparents, they taught me respect. And that's the custom that I've learned to kind of swallow a harder pill, not to only respect your people and your elders, but also to respect those people that want to tear you down and welcome them to the table and have those discussions with them. And I'm coming into my own and I'm going to have to invite these people and really, you know, um, give them a positive vibe back. Like Tina, I have my own customs. I do weekly. I am a very spiritual person. I literally absorb everyone's energy that I come in contact with. So on Sundays, I burn my own sage and I meditate. I have learned over the years as my dad's apprentice in our spiritual practices that you have to take care of your mind, body, and soul because you're the only one looking after yourself. And so just seeing how vastly different this place has changed this the last decade, it's taken a toll on me personally, just having a nice mindset to go to a moment and not see someone, you know, throwing trash in the ocean or, you know, if I, if I go on a hike, I'm really taking my own bag, picking up trash I see there. It's just, it's really sad when it's such a beautiful place and you just see trash everywhere. So. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's see. So I think for the next question, um, Maybe I'll combine a couple again. So I don't know if maybe any of you could share a little bit for those here who might be unfamiliar with the local history, which probably a lot of us. Um, could you share a little bit about any important historical events or experiences that have shaped um, the local tribal history and identity? Kind of paired with that, um, how have colonization and its aftermath affected the community and what's being done to address historical injustices? Um, or Maybe you can share examples or stories of resilience and resistance um, within within your recent history. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, Teresa addressed a lot of the history of, of colonization, and I'm sure a lot of you are, are abreast of a lot of it. Um, but I think the thing that continues to happen is that there is an awareness, there is, um, whether it's environmental groups or colleges or just different orgs, they want to include the native voice, but it's still extractive. 
they want you to come and they want to ask you a million questions and they want to write it down and then they want to publish it and own it and act, you know take it from there where i really feel that the native people need to be leading the efforts there is so much more that you can't write down there's so much more that you have to teach through action and through ceremony and so that's what happens when academia takes the traditional knowledge is they only take that knowledge and they don't take the spirit behind it. And um, the, the life, the, the mother earth, the waters, the life sources, they're not gonna thrive if we're missing that piece of love and, and just dedication that our people had to the lands and the waters, that relationship that we have to them. Um, not resources, relationships. And when you start looking at your earth mother as your mother, you take a lot better care of her. You show her the love because she's showing us the love every single day. She gives us everything we need to survive, right? So um, yeah, I think I'll stop that. You wanna go? <laughs> Uh, do you mind repeating the question? Oh, <laughs> so I was asking about um, colonization, it, how it's affected. important historical events, but, colonization impacts and stories of resilience or resistance. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see, November 1st, 1776, Sarah <laughs> came and brought the mission. No, uh, yeah, it's been, you know, I, I would sit there and listen to my grandfather talk about um, the starting of it all and he you know and my dad says this too you know a lot of people think there was mass genocide on us and it wasn't like that they needed us to be their laborers they needed us to show them the ways of the land what to eat and to really be their um, their workers their vaqueros you know we went from living on the land to becoming farmers and cowboys and then now here we are and I'm on TikTok 24 seven. So <laughs> it's just like a big difference in timeline. We've come so far in just the last 500 years from then to now. And I think just bringing back um, a lot of the old traditions and, you know, like just my facial markings, Tina's facial markings. It was controversial a decade ago. It was kind of something that, you know, you're like, wow, that girl's far out. She has her facial markings and it's just like, well, do you know the meaning behind them? And it kind of just shows that, you know, we're getting back to our old ways and really, you know, um, solidifying into our roots here. And we're not going anywhere. So. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about, um, I'll talk about Panhe, uh, which is one of our southernmost village sites. Um, and I'll talk about Panhe because probably even though I'm guessing a lot of people in this room aren't familiar with Panhe, you probably are familiar um, with Trestles Beach or Camp Pendleton Marine Base or the Beach Boys song about Trestles Beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, San Onofre, San Onofre nuclear plant, right? Um, that's all near the village of, of Panhe. Um, when you drive south on the five from here, the 405, um, and you see Christianitos Road, it's the exit where you you get off to go to San Onofre. I mean, it's does anybody know why it's called Christianitos Road? I'm curious. It okay. So it's called Christianitos Road because that is allegedly where the first um baptism, you know, I'll, I'll say forced baptism. I don't know for sure, but I'm betting it wasn't, you know, totally <laughs> consensual. Um, <laughs> the first uh, baptism in California took place. Um and those were from uh, ancestors taken from the village side of Panhe. Um, <clears throat> and about, I guess, 20 years ago now, um, there was a effort by the Transportation Corridor Agency to put a six lane toll road down south to finish off the 73, 73, 76, uh, one of the sevens around here. Um, and it would have bisected the state park and it would have come within 10 feet of our burial ground, right? And because it was, you know, an iconic surf spot and there were endangered species there, I know that the pocket mouse was the endangered species because in the environmental impact reports, there was like a 200 page report about the pocket mouse and a paragraph about the significance of the site to our people. And I'm not even exaggerating, like literally there was a 200 page report about the pocket mouse and a paragraph about the significance of the site to our people. 
And myself and Rebecca Robles, who's also a Hashimim, but from a different Hashimim tribe, um, we met at a California Native American Heritage Commission hearing is when I was in law school and she said, hey, you know, do you want to put aside our family differences and start this organization because we have to have our voices heard? And so we did, um, and, and folks from all of the different Ahashimim tribes participated. And the one rule was, you know, leave the politics at the door. Like, this is a sacred site. We're here to protect the site. Um, and it worked really well, and it was, it was amazing. Um, but it was also really challenging. I want to give a lot of credit to the Native youth who started the movement at Standing Rock, because that has been an instrumental moment for all of us in terms of awareness and the ways in which people are more accountable to Native nations and our concerns over um, protecting our environment and our cultures. But at the time, it wasn't like that. I remember <clears throat> myself and three of my elders approached uh, a reporter for the Orange County Register because they'd written an article in which they said that um, the Hashimoto tribe didn't care about the site. And they had no... Um, sources for it. They I mean, it was literally just something made up. And so we thought, you know, if we go to them and say this, then they'll have to retract it. They just literally didn't care. They're like, I, we don't care, you know, is what they said. And you, so here we are, I, I am with three of my elders and listening to someone whose job it is to report the truth, just saying, you're not important enough for me to have to care about whether or not what I'm reporting is true. Um, and even with the environmental organizations, it was a real struggle to get them to engage with us in any way that was meaningful and not co-optive. Um, and I wanted to, the other reason I wanted to talk about that example is because I think it's a great example of the opposite of what Teresa recommends in her work, which is, you know, community led and accountable research, or that's, you know, also what the research justice initiative here at UCI tries to do. And I'll never forget, there was an academic, um, and it's sad because she was also native, she wasn't California native, but she approached Rebecca Robles and I and had wanted to write her master's thesis about our sacred site, Panhe. And Rebecca and I both said no. And we said no, or I said no at least, because um, her iteration of what happened at that site was totally wrong. Um, she wanted to put forward this position that, um, the, that the only reason we've been able to protect that site is because we partnered with the mainstream environmentalists. But that was false. I mean, we went, I went on behalf of my nation to, you know, DC and met with the National Register of Historic Places advisor, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the Department of Transportation, Camp Pendleton. <clears throat> Even though we were not a federally recognized nation, my nation, under the leadership of, of Sierra's grandfather, David Bellardis, asserted ourselves as sovereign. We conducted ourselves as a sovereign nation. And, you know, the entity has responded to that. Um, and I, I won't mention the name of the book, but you can find it today. This person is, um, you know, published an article that she then turned into a chapter of her book um, that's widely used today, you know, as an example of how to talk about indigenous environmental justice issues. And I, I say that um, just to share with you all uh, that I hope one thing you'll take away from this is that, you know, consent is everything not just in the spectrum in which we typically talk about consent, but consent is everything when it comes to working with, engaging with, and particularly researching on Native nations and Indigenous communities. Um, and even though that's something that happened, you know, nearly two decades ago now, uh, it still hurts my heart, you know, because our tribal nation didn't, our people didn't consent to that. And so a false story was told and it, with real consequences, because as tribes who don't have uh, land and who aren't federally recognized, those stories in which, you know, we have a success from asserting our sovereignty are few and far between. And Panhe is one of those stories. Um, and so, yeah, it's important always to to be accountable to and be really clear with the people that, that you're working with um, on these kinds of issues. I will agree with you. I mean, this isn't to your yeah. question necessarily, but... Um... I think that the future of engagement with Native people on a research standpoint is participatory. It's not community engaged. That's like a spectrum between like consultation and collaboration. Um, like I fully believe that like if we if we want to truly engage Native people, um, 
we need to take participatory approaches. And I think that some people, uh, some of you all here who are part of like the climate justice program um, that are learning about like community engaged or community based participatory research methods, there is a really wonderful piece, uh, two pieces actually that talk about tribal based participatory research methods and like how we are um, committing, or how, how native people communities are guiding all of that. I think the framework that you have at Sacred Places too is like a perfect example of that. Although you're a native organization, but you're like um, the, all the communities that you work with, like you employ native people, right? And so like a participatory approach and tribal based particip participatory research is like not only are you, not only is the community driving, dictating all the terms of the research, but you're actually, when you're engaging with them, you're also employing members of that community to liaison between the, the, the research team and the tribal community, which is, it's all one team really. So um, yeah, I, I think that I could share the pieces if you wanna see them. Yeah. I, it comes a lot out of um, like public health work um, and thinking about this participatory approach. I would just say like to the question around like, um, I mean, there's a lot to be said about Los Angeles and Orange County, um, Irvine in particular, when we think about development and the Irvine company. Um, and like, you know, how that even looks in this space. And um, I had the, the privilege of conducting research on the history of uh, UCLA's lands and how that, that land in particular um, changed hands from the Spanish period to the Mexican period, how the land was privatized into ranchos and then uh, subsequently um, sold and, and cut up into different pieces and sold and resold and resold and became um, a part of uh, the UC region or became to be owned or UC regions. Um, and so, you know, the UC Irvine similarly has a very compelling and a very interesting story. And um, I think, you know, uh, they're we're positioning ourselves well um, to do that research. Um, but again, that would be, um, with the community. Um, when I did that project with my sister, you know, we're, we are members of the community. Um, and so we were telling the story from our perspective, um, participatory project with Kumeyaay members um, at UC San Diego about that university. And so I think, you know, down the road, if there's resources available, we'll take a participatory approach to kind of think about Irvine um, and the university in that sort of way. Um, I mean, yeah, a lot could be said about the dynamics here in in Southern California around development. Um, but I think that the greatest story of resistance and resilience is the fact that we're sitting here with you, that there's native people in this room and that we're all sitting here and we represent like the, the, re the resistance of our ancestors who survived the mission system, who survived the rancho period and who survived genocide right when California became a state um, that lacked for uh, several decades. Um, and then we've been able to endure and remain in our ancestral homelands and maintain that connection. And so I think that that is really like in the face of um, erasure and removal and dispossession and even being priced out of our own homelands because it's so freaking expensive to live in Southern California, um, like we're still here. And I think that's probably one of the greatest demonstrations of resilience and resistance. Great, all right. So you're touching on a lot of topics that kind of tie in with other questions on, on my list here. So I think I wanna go back to Angela mentioned um, uh, land rematriation, um, which has been a huge topic as probably many of you know. So in recent years, the land back movement has gained momentum calling for return of ancestral lands to indigenous communities. We are here at UCI, a land grant institution, which if you go hear our chancellor speak, there will be really touting that as you know, one of the great things about this university that the land, the land grant system, which we all know was you know, um, built from money raised from stolen Indian lands. And so with this complex history, Southern California of indigenous dispossession and colonization, how can we as a university, staff, students, faculty, um, engage in a meaningful dialogue and action to support land rematriation in Southern California, honoring the rights and sovereignty of local indigenous nations and fostering reconciliation and healing within the broader community. 
maybe that's kind of a big question, but if you could share your pers perspectives on that, <laughs> it would be great. Well, the first thing I thought of when you were saying that is uh, the Gabrielino Road that is where um, a lot of faculty housing for UCI is. How many Tongva people get to live on <laughs> Gabrielino Road? And, um, none that I know of, right? And there's not even an Ahashmam Road, so that is also a problem. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but but for real, um, those kinds of things, it's not a joke that like our own people can't afford to live in our homelands. I can't afford to live here, you know? Um, most of the Ahashaman people that I know who live in their homelands live in homes that have been passed down to them, not homes that they've been able to buy on their own in their homelands. Very similar in LA, particularly coastal parts of Los Angeles. Um, and so the housing issue is a, is a real issue. I think um, in terms of the university itself uh, and just the massive amount of resources that are here, when are those resources made available to the people whose lands we're on? Um, you know, the, Tina's daughter, Justa talks about this all the time, the free parking in our homelands, right? Like get UCI to, that's something simple, you know, have them create parking passes for Ahashima and Tongo people. Boom, that's great. I can come here anytime I need and not have to pay for parking. Um, Cause, and you know, that's something that we've done like with our partners at Crystal Cove Conservancy. So now Tongva and Ahashimam people aren't supposed to have to pay for parking. It's, it seems like a small deal, but it's not when parking's 20 bucks and, and more than the cost of parking for me is just the um, microaggression or the little violation that it feels every time I'm asked to like cough up money to exist on my homelands or to pray at the ocean, especially when you see the, multi-million dollar mansions overlooking it. Um, and so I, I guess, you know, the short answer I would say is, is, you know, be always vigilant and then intentional about your advocacy because there are so many spaces, all, all spaces should have, if it's a public health space, if it's a land use planning space, if it's a public art space, whatever it is, it should all have representation from both the Tongva and Ahashimam nations there. And so whatever spaces you find yourself in, if you're just asking the question, um, who's not in this room? And then being an advocate for who, you know, should be in that room. Um, and then on the real support land back movements, uh, because we, it's a critical, you know, there's the 380 acre site at Ganga, um, otherwise known as Banning Ranch, otherwise known as Randall Preserve. FYI, Banning Ranch Conservancies having a talk led by a non-Indian on a Hashiman people, I think tomorrow night or something. So I'm glad y'all are here instead, but I, that's the kind of ridiculousness in Orange County. I mean, I was reading in one local paper, an article written by a non-Native person talking about other non-Native people who wrote about the Hashiman people 200 years ago. And that was their nod to Native American History Month, right? So um, there's a lot of work to be done in this place to just change the consciousness of the people around you. And I find that especially in Orange County, there's a lot of resistance to the idea of land back. And so anything you all can do to learn about that movement um, and then be those advocates, because sometimes people hear that kind of thing better from somebody outside of the community than coming from us directly. And I could talk forever, so let me just give it to whoever. <laughs> I like to take it back to the lands. I always ask people to, to, I mean, we think about how it was before colonization and how there was just forests of oak trees and how the soil was healthy, right? Now you dig and you see no life in the soil, it's dirt. And so I try to get people to be aware of our need to make the soil healthy again and to plant the plants that are supposed to be here with that creator put here, which helps the environment, which helps the ecosystems. Um, so that's where I would like to take it. Also for a long time, um, the Tongva had to say that we're landless tribes. That's not anymore. We do have three different parcels of lands that have been given back to the Gabrielino peoples. Yes, um, and one of the things that it's, um, it, it's a celebration, right? We have a place that we can gather, we have a place that we could have ceremony. That's beautiful. But it's not the way it used to be, you know. Um, 
we had to become a 501c3, we had to create a conservancy, we have to pay taxes, we have to have insurance. There's all these incredible expenses that come with land back. And there's also, you know, about rematriating the lands because these lands that were being given have been neglected and harmed for so long that it's gonna take a very long time, a lot of work to bring it back to health. And so we could use help, you know, with people's um, donations, but also with their donations of time and effort to help us. Um, but of course, it'll take us time to be able to get people safely onto the land to begin with. And always have to be with ceremony and bringing our, our peoples, the original peoples there first to gather and then opening it up to the greater communities. But think about how big our lands uh, are, you know, our territories and that it was once all very healthy. So it's not only the land back opportunities that we need help with, it's all lands. We need to bring the lands back to health. We need to bring the waters back to health and everybody can do something to help. Um, I won't waste too much of your time, but um, they did say quite a bit and I do agree with both Angela and with Tina. Um, land, you know, disrespect for land is where we get the fruit sweets, where we get, um, you know, our stock. It's just how we want to maintain it. And um, I remember back when I was younger and just listening to different conversations that my grandfather would have, um, and one of them being in the early 90s where they did offer us land, but it wasn't here. It was out in the desert. 200 miles that way and that's where they wanted us to settle and that's where they wanted us to live and it was just a real slap in the face like oh you can't have this land because it's already been developed and it's already been you know sectioned for this and that um, more recently I, I live in San Juan Capuchero I know my family's been there for a very long time um, and I almost lost my house last year they wanted to expand the freeway they wanted to um, make it condominiums so that there was more people that could be in already at overpopulated town. And I think it just comes down to that. Um, there's just so many people here. We could do so much, you know, we could really just band together and just, you know, get this place back to a healthy living style. Um, I, I would love to see the stars. There's so much light pollution here. Like, you know, my, I just, love looking and my favorite place to look at the stars is in Utah which is nowhere near here and <laughs> just to see the milk the Milky Way and you know and really get to hear those stories again by the fire and just have time with each other under just natural stars it would be really cool but thank you <laughs> okay so <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask one more question, which is probably a bit of a loaded question, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so university land acknowledgements have been, um, have, you know, uh, become more prevalent as a way to recognize the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands uh, institutions are built. Um, and as you are probably all aware, UCI is working towards a land acknowledgement and there has been, but has not yet formally adopted one. Um, I wanted to ask if you could say a little bit about how important you think this process is and how important you feel it is for UCI and other universities to have land acknowledgements and what important advice would you give to those involved in this process? <laughs> I wrote two articles about it. <laughs> the tallest. Um, but no, I mean, I think right now, like there's a conversation going around around like, Let's scrap the land acknowledgement if it's not meaningful. Um, and I think that there's a lot of harm um, in that. But I also simultaneously think that there's a lot of harm in doing a land acknowledgement and it becoming a rote gesture that's just performative and really empty. And like, you know, part of this like diversity, uh, equity, inclusion sort of checklist. Um, and so it it's complex, but it actually really isn't complex. Um, uh, yeah, the I, I 
At the moment, I'm working with a graduate student who's Kumihai, um, and we're analyzing 250 language statements from universities from across the US. Um, across 250 statements, there are no actionable items tied to those statements. Um, and these are all land grant institutions, public universities. Um, and so I think, I, hopefully I can, like capture your question uh, or will respond to it appropriately. Um, I think that if any institutions were to do anything um, in adopting a land acknowledgement, they also have to do like proper, have, have meaningful conversations with local communities around around not what the statement should say, but how do we be in good relationship with you? And, and you don't need a statement. You could actually just do the work, um, right? Like uh, the statement could actually come later. The work should actually come first. The engagement should come first. And when you are ready for that statement, when you're in good relationship with the local communities um, and you write that statement together um, and, and they guide you on how they wanna be acknowledged, and they want their lands to be acknowledged, um, they sh that statement should also include some actionable items on like what you are committing to that community, right? Free parking, uh, admission, tuition remission or tuition waivers, um, housing uh, for, for students to come to the school, um, time for faculty to liaise with the community. Now there's like so many things that institutions can do, um, but there's much more work that has to come before the actual land acknowledgement is written. I've been an advisor for many different land acknowledgements and I would say um, everything you're saying is I agree with, um, but not doing a land acknowledgement, that's not okay because we've been in, uh, invisible on our lands way too long. So that must happen. But I do agree that there has to be, what I tell people is it's like a handshake. You know, we help you to develop this land acknowledgement. You can't just go and copy UCLA's. That's just checking the box. You have to have a committee sit together and you have to think about where, how you feel and what you can express and be truthful. And then what you put down in that statement is like a handshake. Then you go on with the relationships with the people and you, um, everything that you've mentioned, those are things that can be done, but also letting us be the voice, letting us come in and share in the classes. And don't just call us for a five minute land acknowledgement. I'm not gonna drive to Irvine to do a five minute land acknowledgement or that's just a waste of gas. Anybody can do a land acknowledgement but it has to be something that you can stand by and say, yes, I agree with this statement. Everyone who's delivering that statement, it's something they believe in. But invite us on the big events that you have and don't put a timeline. Let us speak, let us share because anybody could do the land acknowledgement, right? You did a beautiful one to begin with and that's fine, but there, it's more. So it's, please do acknowledge us but then also create the relationships and let's work together. Let's be a community. Thank you, Tina. Um, yeah, acknowledge us, but it's also kind of um, learning different customs. It's how you properly approach us in a way that's respectful and um, not like, hey, we need to do this because uh, someone said that we had to, or um, <laughs> it's more just like being, very much um, genuine, you know, just like you actually want this, you actually want this um, for your community, for your university. Um, it's something that your students are asking for. You want it to be a, um, a group thing, but I think it's just like getting consent, like Angela was saying, and getting the right actions in place, like um, Teresa was saying, and really just acknowledging, just like Tina said, I think that's all. Okay, so uh, we have about five minutes left. I don't know. Uh, I've got a lot more questions. I don't know. Are there questions in the in the webinar? Sorry, no. Okay, well, why don't we take a couple of questions from folks? I just saw your hand, and then um, Fantasia. Mm -hmm.
that's another card that describes it. Oh, there's no. A presentation <laughs> with one of them and one of us wasn't alerted because they went through a different tribe um that also happened recently with um you know introducing the oh in oh, okay. the oh good yeah out in um Dana Point Harbor and I would have loved to have been there and you know it's just kind of unfortunate when they go through other because there's just, you know, there's like four different tribes within just Ahashman alone. So there may have been. I can't speak that we were there, but yeah, I'm sure someone may have been there. But I'll look into it. Hopefully someone was there. <laughs> oh, I actually want to make sure that uh, students have a moment to do that. I just wanted to add to Tina's piece that you're talking about driving. Like, let, the, let, let you say what you want to say. And I was like, and obviously pay you money. Like you talk about free publication. I'm like honorarium, like a thousand bucks, please. Thank you. That's all. I just want to say, well, thank you for even coming here, spending your time here, because I'll say it as it is. My background is complex because I'm colonized and I'm the colonizer. Um, being from Mexico, that's all I know because my great grandparents didn't want to talk about the indigenous people they came from. But we also know that we're part Spaniards because colonization is not complex. It's straightforward. It was an intentional erasure. Um, and so for me, I find it sometimes difficult being in academic spaces because I always call it out. I'm like an academic institution. We're all being settlers in this space. We're all contributing to the erasure, to the genocide, right? The UC system is highly invested in militarization. Um, but I'm wondering what advice you have for someone who comes from this identity where in Mexico, we don't have a way to fully acknowledge who we are when we come from these split identities. What recommendations or advice or just like messages would you have to someone struggling with that? Um, I find myself always advocating to do health justice work and advocating against continuing this form of colonization, but it's so deeply embedded into colonial structures, like Mexico's government is colonial. The term Mexico was created by Spaniards. There's no acknowledgement of the indigenous people there. And so I find it difficult sometimes when I'm trying to speak about indigenous issues because I'm not recognized as one, nor can I claim that um, in accordance to what white Eurocentric perspectives have put as what you should be if you're indigenous or what you should be considered this or that. I'm just kind of wondering what advice you have for continuing our work? And I'm specifically looking at you, um, uh, just because you're a professor within these institutions and I feel like you, you might have these like in, internal struggles and not to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but just wondering about that, because um, I'm having a lot of trouble continuing wanting to be in public health and public health is continuing supporting colonization in modern times of what we're seeing happening around the world. Um, I mean, Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> I would say, um, you know, first, um, I'm happy to talk with you off Zoom. <laughs> um, and so, but just I'm happy to talk with you and connect with you um, after this, if you want to chat a little bit more even beyond that. Um, and then I would also say, like, to relate to you, like, I'm of mixed ancestry. My dad's Caucasian. He's Scottish-American. Um, his family were some of the first colonizers of Massachusetts Bay. Um, and my mom is mixed as well. She's native, she's Gabrielino and Tongva, and she's also Chicana. Um, and that's how she would identify. Um, and so I also am very mixed. Um, but there's something for me, and it's different when you're in the diaspora or if you've like migrated or immigrated or, or you've moved. Um, but for me, um, being within my ancestral territory was a very... Um, uh, salient aspect of my life, right? Um, it allowed me to be very close to my family um, and over time become very close to community members. Um, and, uh, but it's not to say it's easy or it's, um, you know, it's, it, that it's not challenging. Um, but like for me, that is the identity that I honor and that I've had the privilege of, of understanding and developing and being most connected to. Um, and 
I think that we all are on, like all of us um, in this room are like on a journey of self-discovery and um, understanding and have a desire to belong. Um, and when we're in academic institutions, they're incredibly dehumanizing um, and demoralizing um, in certain circumstances. And so it can strip away that understanding of who we are or that even infringe on the process of trying to belong and trying to understand. Um, and I think that awareness is really critical and important to all of us in trying to understand like our place in this world, right? And like, who are we connected to? Um, and all I can really say at this point, I feel like I've said a lot, um, is I would take that time, like nobody, a lot of people can say who they think you are, right? Um, and they can have certain expectations of you and certain understandings of you without ever knowing you. Um, colonialism is a, a, is a bitch. <laughs> I'll pay the fine. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> um, but uh, it has been successful in what it has done to our understandings of ourselves. Um, and for some of us, we've had to um, undergo the process of like taking that time to self-reflect and like really um, understand the legacy and the history of our people. And so for me, I would just like my advice to you would be like, um, like know who your ancestors are and hold on to that. Um, and don't let that change your character or your nature or who you are don't let it diminish you or um um discourage you from having a voice um and the un the the way of moving through institutions that comes with time and, and practice and different experiences it's not a straightforward path it's a windy road but i'm happy to talk with you Thank you so much. And thank you for the question. Um, if you want to read one or two, we can. Sure. Um, okay, so there's a question um, from Julia. I'm curious what the panelists think about engagement with local environmental groups. Does that feel worthy of their time? I mean, I think that's a really complex question that doesn't have a singular answer. It really depends on the circumstance, the environmental org, what the issue is. I mean, there are so many um, factors, you know. Um, I've had really good experiences with environmental orgs, and I've had really awful experiences with environmental orgs. And for me personally, whether or not I've chosen to work with them really depends on, you know, how high the stakes are and, 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 you know, what's needed, right? Like at Panhe, um, because there wasn't a lot of um, institutional structures or support for Native nations, we kind of had no choice but to work with the environmentalists at some point, but we stopped. Um, and we stopped really because of a lot of the racism embedded in those mainstream environmental organizations um, and the tokenization. And so I think, um, whether or not it's worth it is always going to be, you know, a decision of the particular tribal nation or organization. Um, and I'll say that environmental orgs, you know, are, are getting better, but there's still a lot of work to be done. I don't know what the data is, but I suspect if you were to do a meta analysis of all of the mainstream environmental orgs over the country, I bet a very, very small percentage of them had native folks uh, in any sort of leadership position. Okay, so I know we're we're over time. Um, before we end, though, I just wanted to ask really quickly if there was anything else that you didn't have a chance to say that you'd like to share. And also if you have any, and we have Native students in the room, Native UCI students, and we also have all of the fellows in our Climate Justice Initiative. And if you have any advice on them for how they can respectfully engage with your communities, how they can contribute resources, ways to get in touch, et cetera anything like that? Um, I'll just say real quickly, I, I wish it had been fixed by now. Have they funded that position yet for Native? Nope. Okay, so <laughs> then, then this is what I'll say. Um, the um, person, the position that was supposed to be here on campus to um, support Native student retention 
has been vacant for like what six years now five six years uh, almost five years yeah, yeah almost five years and so it's a real slap in the face um i think to us as indigenous nations whose lands this place is on when the university is like rushing to get a land acknowledgement adopted and yet they're for five years refusing to fund a position and they're funding native recruitment but it's like how dare you how dare you put our students um in harm's way like that if you're gonna fund for native recruitment but not fun to support Native students when they're there. And so I'll just say for Native students and faculty on campus, anytime I can lend myself as someone from a local tribal community to support that, because I'm grateful to the Native students that are here and I don't want you to have to be here alone. Orange County is not an easy place to be Indigenous. Um, so anything I can do to support you for sure. I would echo that. Um... I, I can't speak for a tribal organization or a government. Um, I would encourage you if you um, want to do that sort of engagement to do your research and be really thoughtful around who and how you engage them. Um, but I would say for the students um, in the room, the native students, um, I'm always happy to be a resource. Um, if you want more information on participatory research methods, um, if you just need someone to talk to, um, like about your journey, um, being a student is really difficult. Um, and um, it also can be really um, fun, um, too. Um, but I think we often need like an auntie in there that like, <laughs> like smacks us and um, it's just there's someone, someone to talk to. So if you want to reach out, um, I'm, I'm available. Um, I'm not that busy, actually. <laughs> Yeah, well, I want to thank everybody for your time and sharing this space with us. Um, but for our students, I'll put my auntie hat on and I'll tell you that I'm very proud of you all, that you're here, you're doing it, and you're the future leaders. So we do support you. And I also am available anytime you have questions or you need any kind of encouragement. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that thank you all for having me and Thank you to the fellow panelists for letting me be included. Um, I do wish you all luck on your journeys on this path and um, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. Let's thank all of you. This was really wonderful and we, we should definitely try and make this an annual event again. <laughs> Thanks for coming everyone.